Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over Aeolian depositional environments, or deserts. So first we're going to talk about some classification of Aeolian environments. Aeolian environments can include deserts and semi-arid regions, like we just mentioned. Also, beaches and sabkas, which are sand flats, and sandy riverbanks and paraglacial regions. But we're going to be focusing on desert environments and desert bed forms and stratigraphy in this lecture. So to the bottom left, here we have a figure showing where desert environments can commonly occur, which is adjacent to environments such as salt flats, playa lakes, mountain regions, alluvial environments, etc. And in the figure to the bottom right, we have a map showing the distribution of deserts in the world. And we have the light tan regions being the desert environments, either polar deserts or deserts near the equator, which are typically dominated by sand rather than snow. Uh, but it's the same concept. And so we'll be focusing on the sand deserts and sand dunes and sand dune fields, etc. And the distribution of these deserts throughout the world is controlled largely by the Coriolis effect, which deflects moving air affecting the wind currents on a global scale. And we'll talk a little bit about how mountain ranges as well as the wind currents that flow across mountain ranges, how that can affect where deserts can be found and how that can affect the adjacent facies that we'll see near desert environments. So in this slide, we can see that there are certain certain ways that sediment can be transported through an Aeolian system, such as saltation, creep, and suspension. We talked about these different types of transport in the fluvial environment video because all of these types of transport can also happen in water transport as well as wind transport. But I'll go back over them briefly for the sake of this video. For example, we have saltation, which is the bouncing along of sediment grains, and this is the most common type of sediment movement in sand dunes. Additionally, we have creep or traction where grains are too large for wind to pick them up completely or even to bounce them along like saltation so it rolls them along the ground instead of picking them up and then we have suspension which is the complete picking up of a very fine grains like silt and clay particles and carrying them through the atmosphere up to 2,500 meters we'll talk a little bit more about aeolian dust and dust transport throughout the world later but that is the basic types of sediment movement through aeolian systems. Then we have types of wind erosion like deflation and abrasion. We have deflation shown in this top right figure. What we have here is the formation of desert pavement by blowing away sand, silt, and clay-sized particles, leaving larger particles behind. Deflation leaves what's called lag deposits or lag gravel. Additionally, we can have abrasion, which is natural sand blasting, and this forms what's called yardangs. Yardangs have a very flat face that was sand blasted or abraded, causing the distinctive morphology that we see on the right side of this lower figure. Next, Aeolian bed forms. Common Aeolian bed forms include sand sheets, ripples, dunes, and draws. We can see in this image to the right, we have ripples on the desert ground as we look down, and then as we look further into the distance, a little bit covered by my image, sorry, we have a larger dune. And then we can also have preserved features where we see preserved ripples like in the middle figure and then we have preserved climbing ripples like in the left figure and we'll talk about what that means for what the adjacent environment is to Aeolian systems later as well as we'll show examples of preserved dune bedding in later slides. But first we'll talk about ripple and dune formation. What happens in Aeolian environments is wind pushes grains from the staw side to the lee side of a dune causing dune migration and the formation of cross bedded forsets indicative of wind direction. This is shown in this animation we have here where wind is pushing the dune forward as it transports grains from the saw side of the dune, that long side, on the back side of it, and then it pushes them to the lee side, causing the migration, and this causes forsets, and we can tell the direction of wind due to dune preservation. Additionally, we see here to the right that wind is a very effective sorting agent, and it's causing really well-rounded grains, but also very well-sorted grains. And you only deposits are generally well sorted and well rounded. We also have dune morphology. Here is an image showing six different types of 
dunes. These include longitudinal or linear dunes indicative of a bidirectional wind direction. We also have barken dunes or horn dunes which form horn-like U structures with their horns facing with the direction of the wind and then we have transverse dunes or straight crested dunes which show also a consistent wind direction which are very common shapes of dunes and then we also have barkanoid dunes which are similar to barkens but on a smaller scale. Then we have parabolic dunes which are the opposite of barken dunes. They form similar U-shapes but their horns are facing in the direction opposite to the wind and these form typically in areas where there's more vegetation than typical dune field environments. Lastly we have star dunes which are indicative of multi-directional wind. And the last type of bed form that we talked about was draws. Draws are very large scale dunes with smaller superimposed dunes and ripples on them. We talked in the title depositional environment video about compound dunes. These are similar but just on a, a huge scale. And now we can go into a little bit more detail about sand sheets and dust. We talked about the most common bed forms, ripples and dunes, but sand sheets and dust are also commonly associated with aeolian environments. And sand sheets, for example, consist of coarse planar bedded sand. And this is shown in the image to the right. And they are coarser than the typical aeolian sand deposits because they are lag deposits in a zone of transport and bypassing. And we talked about on one of the first slides, lag deposits being left over from deflation. And this is typical of what sand sheets will be. And then we also have aeolian dust listed here, which is typically silt sized. And this is called LUS. And this aeolian dust or LUS can be deposited in very fine structuralist deposits, but it also can be blown over very vast distances and accumulate in adjacent or <laughs> way far away areas. It's really dependent on the Coriolis effect, global wind patterns, etc., and how much less is available to be transported. For example, in the Saharan desert, we have incredible dust transport or less transport from the Saharan to the Amazon rainforest, as well as Florida's west coast causing the red tide, because what happens is nutrients in the dust, like phosphorus and iron, can cause increased biological productivity, helping the growth and the productivity of the Amazon forest, but also causing the red tide along Florida's west coast, which is an algal bloom that can be detrimental to the health of that environment. Additionally, we have aeolian facies and adjacent facies, which we'll discuss here. What happens in aeolian environments typically where they form is because we have a mountain belt, and I told you we'd get to why mountain belts and their placement can affect aeolian facies. It's because when we have a mountain belt and we have air or wind moving toward the windward slope of that mountain belt, it cools and condenses and precipitation occurs. And then as it moves over to the leeward side of that mountain belt, we have a drying of that air. It warms, precipitation does not occur, and then you'll have a really dry desert environment, such as the Atacama Desert in this figure to the top right. And we also have on this lower figure an indication of kind of what environments will be adjacent to desert environments because of this mountain belt desert formation process. What we have here is alluvial fan deposits and distal fluvial deposition, and then playa lake deposition adjacent to the desert environment in this image. And these are typical adjacent environments that we'll see in aeolian deposits and therefore in aeolian stratigraphy interfingered with the aeolian deposits. And we'll show this in a strap column on a later slide. But first we'll talk about how dunes and aeolian deposits can be preserved. What we know is that dunes tend to form on flat surfaces, and this could be bedrock, but more often soil or regolith that is held in place by groundwater. Groundwater diffuses upward from the water table by capillary action, and dunes can be preserved if the water table rises beneath the dune field. So what happens is when this water table rises, the dunes can be immobilized and eventually lithified by precipitation of cements in between the sand grains, causing aeolian sandstone. And accumulation space can cause even better preservation for deserts and playas made by subsidence and is also a function of water table. Now, there are three main types of preservation systems for aeolian deposits. What we have is dry systems where the water table and its capillary fringe lie at a depth below the depositional surface. Then we have wet systems where the water table is at or near the depositional surface and deposition, bypass, and erosion are controlled by the moisture content. And then we have stabilized systems where vegetation, surface cementation, or mud drapes play a stabilizing role and influence the behavior of the accumulating surface. So now we'll talk about what happens 
after the Dune Certigui has been preserved and we have Aeolian facies to look at in the rock record, these will typically be, if they're dune fields, planar or cross bedded sand with the planar beds indicating the wind direction. And this will depend, of course, on the dune morphology, but in general, Aeolian dune deposits are typical of the two figures on the right in the rock record. And what we can see in a strat column of a dune environment is interfingering of adjacent environments. We've talked a little bit about adjacent environments like stream deposits, alluvial fan deposits, and playa lake deposits. And we can see these in this figure. What we see in the strat column is the typical cross bedded sands of the Aeolian environment and those dunes that are forming there. And then what we have is some finer mud deposits from lacustrine facies, a playa, mud flats maybe, and then we have some coarser alluvial deposits, typical of alluvial fan deposition. And then we have braid plain and distal alluvial fluvial systems shown here on the top of the strat column where we've got these channel deposits, typical of that distal braided system from alluvial fan deposits. And all of these can be another indication that we are looking at dune fields in the cross bedded sands because we know that the adjacent environments are typical of Aeolian environments. Now we'll talk about how to recognize Aeolian versus fluvial Aeolian environments. What we can do to tell the difference between Aeolian and fluvial Aeolian strata is look at the mud content. First of all, fluvial Aeolian strata contain mud layers and interbedded sand and mud drapes on the cross beds. And additionally, fluvial Aeolian deposits commonly contain climbing ripples, like the image we saw earlier in the first slide where I showed examples of preserved Aeolian deposits. We have climbing ripples indicative of more fluvially influenced Aeolian system. Then in Aeolian dominated systems, we'll have mostly sand with occasional gravel, but very little to no mud at all. And then also we can have reverse grading in Aeolian dune deposits, where if you have a pure sand Aeolian dune field, you might get some reverse grading due to the way that finer grains will be tossed over to the least side of the dune more often than the coarser grains causing a reverse graded planar bedded sand only deposit indicative of aeolian dominant dune field next to tell the difference between aeolian and beach environment sometimes can feel tricky because beach is also dominated by sands but we can tell the difference between these environments by a multitude of factors including the size of the bed forms first of all we might have a really huge dune deposits and dune field fields like in Aeolian deposits. However, in beach environments, they might be a little smaller in size. But more importantly, we can look at what adjacent facies interfinger with the Aeolian sands. For example, playa alluvial and stream facies in Aeolian systems, whereas in beach sands, what you might get is marginal marine facies, shore face environments, etc. that will interfinger with the beach sands. And so that's a big difference you might see is adjacent facies. Additionally, we can look at the fossil content in these sand facies. What we'll have in a beach environment is obviously marine fossils, but in Aeolian sands we will have little to no fossils, and if we do have any fossils in an Aeolian environment, they will be terrestrial. That is it for Aeolian depositional systems. Guys, I hope this was helpful. Make sure you follow me on Instagram if you want to relook over any of the PowerPoint slides or request new topics for me to go over. My Instagram is at geogirl underscore Graham. It's also on my YouTube channel page if you want to just click the link there. Also, if you guys want to check out the rest of the depot system videos, which will help a lot with understanding each depot system itself, you can check out the playlist I made, which is down at the bottom of the screen here, and it's called Depositional Environments. It has all the environments you could want, and if I'm missing anything, please comment below or message me on Instagram, and I'll be sure to add whatever I am missing. Lastly, if you want to be notified when I post new videos, you can hit that subscribe button, and you'll be hearing every time I'm going to post a new video. Thanks again for watching and I hope you guys learned a lot about Aeolian depositional systems and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye!